Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good afternoon students, this is my first lecture of Muslim law. Today I am going to discuss sources of Muslim law. This is my first lecture. My name is Dr. Rajay Kumar Singh, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Law, BHU. So, before I start my lecture, I would like to highlight few important things which you might be knowing about Islamic jurisprudence. Before I start different sources of Muslim law, I would like to highlight few important things through which you can have complete understanding about Muslim law. So, the important thing is that let us understand the origin of Islam and then after you all would be in position to understand the various sources of Muslim law. Dear students, as we know, Prophet Muhammad, it is believed that in the month of Ramzan, Prophet Muhammad, he heard a very pious message, but you know, it is believed that in 571 AD, Muhammad was born in Mecca and in the years of, in the year of 609, 609 AD, he used to go in a lonely cave for meditation. He was not satisfied with evils, with things which were going on, which were happening in those days in Mecca. So, he was not satisfied those social evils and he had great concern about social problems. So, he wanted to abolish those evil practices which were prevailing at that time like gambling the rate of anticide was so high at that time. Many Arabian people, they were involved in gambling and war. So, he wanted to abolish those practices. It is believed that in the year of 609 AD, when he was meditating in lonely cave, the name of cave is Hira, when he was sitting there, he heard very strange noise and that noise was from Angel Gabriel. So, Angel Gabriel whispered in the ear of Prophet Muhammad that you, you are the messenger of the God, you are the messenger of Allah, God had sent you for the betterment of the society, God has sent you for the betterment of mankind. So, you listen this. So, you see, firstly, Prophet Muhammad could not understand that what was going on at that time, but quickly he understood that it, is, it was the angel Gabriel who conveyed that message from Allah to Prophet Muhammad. So, the first message which was conveyed by Angel Gabriel from God that pious message in Islam is referred as Wahi, W A H A Y, Wahi, that is the first revelation. And since you see the journey which started in the year of 609 AD. Prophet Muhammad used to go in lonely in that cave for meditation and he used to receive 
messages from angel gabriel and then after he used to convey those messages to his followers that today he today he could hear the voice he could uh, get the message from allah from the god from the god and this message is for you and he you see in this way he started preaching to his followers and he decided to preach the people of mecca but you see the arabian people the people of at that time the people of arabia they thought that prophet muhammad was intervening in their personal matters so they decided to oppose him they decided to raise voice against prophet muhammad and prophet muhammad had to face some difficulties in pro some problem at mecca so he decided to leave that place and he left mecca in 622 ad and he went to madina so you see this year 622 ad that great journey which was started by prophet muhammad from mecca to madina that journey great journey is referred as hijarat and hijri era started in the year of 622 ad in islamic law this year 622 ad is referred as hijri era hijarat the great religious journey when prophet muhammad left mecca and for madina so that year 622 ad is known as hijarat in muslim law in islamic law so you need to dear students you need to understand these specific years date 609 ad in the month of ramzan he got first message revealed by allah through angel gabriel and the second important date that is 622 ad hijarat and you see then after prophet muhammad uh, he started preaching to the people who lived in medina so people of medina they believed that prophet muhammad was religious or spiritual as well as religious head and prophet muhammad he tried to uh, convince his followers to unite and he was the first person prophet muhammad was the first person who succeeded in uniting his followers and arabian people so this meanwhile what he did prophet muhammad did it is believed that whatever he said whatever he did for the betterment of his society at medina their good deeds their moral behavior or referred as sunna tradition of prophet muhammad sunnat of prophet muhammad i will discuss in detail when sources of muslim law will be discussed here i just want to quickly highlight development of islam or advent of islam how islam was uh, propagated and uh, developed by prophet muhammad so you see after the advent of islam prophet muhammad was the first person who tried to remove societal evils from the society and we will discuss all these things in our coming sessions here i would like to uh, you see so prophet muhammad uh, became so popular at madina and people of and his followers they believed him they accepted him as spiritual as well as their administrative head so islam became very popular and this popularity was because of prophet muhammad now 
it is believed that whatever preachings whatever prophet muhammad revealed at madina are treated as primary source of muslim law it is said that quran that is primary source of muslim law and it contains 6637 verses so out of 6637 verses 200 verses deals with rules and regulations of muslims 200 verses uh, talks about rules and regulations of islam and it is believed that 200 verses were developed by prophet muhammad at madina rest all talks about ethics morality religious injunctions for example uh, pray five times prayer in a day so after having all these things in mind you all need to understand that how prophet muhammad tried to convince his followers and how um, islam came into existence how islam was propagated now come to this sources of law that is my first chapter which i am going to uh, discuss and which you can see look at the screen on your screen i have made a slide so that uh, you can get entire information about sources of muslim law so for your convenience i have just uh, demarcated a line between these two primary and secondary sources primary sources here which i have mentioned in this slide quran sunnat ijma qiyas there are four you can see you you look at screen quran as a primary source second is sunna as a primary source and third is ijma fourth is qiyas and secondary sources custom precedent and legislation these are custom precedent and legislations are treated as secondary sources of muslim law the reason behind recognizing custom precedent and legislation as a secondary source of muslim law is believe muslim believes that muslim they believe that allah god was supreme legislator so whatever messages were revealed by allah by god through angel gabriel and were compiled those messages are compiled in holy text that text is known as quran so they believe that quran is primary and first important source of islamic law muslim law that is unchangeable i will discuss it in detail so because of that belief custom precedent and legislation these three things are treated as secondary sources of muslim law they believe that authority cannot make law for them state cannot make law for them it was the god it was allah who uh, conveyed the message through angel gabriel to prophet muhammad and in the absence of quranic provision the thing is decided by the authority in the light of traditions of prophet muhammad in the light of preachings and saying of prophet muhammad that is known as sunnat sunnat is regarded as second important source of muslim law and ijma is third important source primary source of muslim law and qiyas is fourth important primary source so you see i have also highlighted the reason for what reason custom precedent and legislation are treated as secondary source quran sunnat ijma and qiyas these things are treated as primary sources of muslim law i have just highlighted the reason now come to this and i will i would like to discuss one by one primary sources of muslim law 
and Quran is the first and foremost important source of Muslim law. So, I would like to discuss with the help of this slide, so you can look at the screen. So, look at this. Quran I have written, Quran as a primary source, Quran is derived from Arabic word Qura. That is Arabic, Quran is Arabic word and which literally means which art to be read, jise padha jana chahiye, which art to be read. I, I have also mentioned birth of Prophet Muhammad, first message 60 AD, 622 left Mecca, went to Medina, that is Hazarat, 632 AD, death of Prophet Muhammad. So, I have gathered all these information at one place, so that you can have complete idea about Quran. So, according to Abdul Rahim, once his disciple Maud, he asked that what law should be applied in deciding any dispute, in deciding any matter. So, Prophet Muhammad said that when Prophet Muhammad asked his disciple Maud that how would he decide a case, a dispute. So, he replied that firstly case would be decided in the light of Quran, failing which the things must be decided in the light of your preachings, your traditions that is Sunnat. And if Quran and Sunnat both are silent, both cannot resolve that problem, then third source, the things must be decided with the help of consensus, with the help of consensus opinion that is Isma. So, you uh, can see the significance of Quran and Sunnah uh, with the help of that statement. Um, so, on the basis of this statement, you can see the importance of Quran and Sunnah. So, since then, authority is bound to decide dispute in the light of Quranic text. And if Quran is silent in a particular matter, then things are decided in the light of Sunnah or preachings of Prophet Muhammad. So, this is uh, the criteria, this is the order through which authority is bound to decide dispute, decide case law. No authority can go beyond the limit prescribed by the Quran, no authority can go. So, they believe that authority is not allowed to intervene in these two things. Now, I would like to highlight few important things of Quran. It is believed that Quran is divine origin. As I said, Quran is compilation of those pious messages which were revealed by God by Allah through Prophet Muhammad. And as I said, Prophet Muhammad was the messenger, Rasul of Prophet Rasul, that is Arabic word, Rasul is messenger. Prophet Muhammad was messenger of Allah. So, <clears throat> after the death of Prophet Muhammad, it was the third caliph Usman who tried to compile those scattered messages. And he was the first person during, during his period, Quran was compiled, it is written in textbook. And in this way, Quran is treated as a divine law, divine, it is a divine origin. It is believed that the origin of Quran is divine. Second important thing is that it contains 6237 verses, 114 surah chapters. You can see it on your screen, 114 surah chapters, surah here means chapters. It is unchangeable. These are significant, these are important features of Quran. It is unchangeable. Authority is not allowed to make any kind of amendment in Quran. So, it is unchangeable. Out of 6237 verses, only 200 verses are relating to rules, regulations for Muslims. So, it is said that only 200 provisions of Quran talks about rules and regulations for 
Muslims. Now, some important chapter surah that is known as surah of Quran, which I would like to highlight. You can see, you see this. Look at this surat ul bakr that surah talks that chapter talks about rules relating to religion and morality another important surah chapter is surat ul nisha rules relating to women that chapter talks about rules relating to women surat ul talaq that is also important chapter surah chapter which talks about rules relating to divorce rules relating to talaq so you see how uh, now i would like to highlight some important features of suratul talaq as you all might be knowing that prophet muhammad he had great concern about evils which were prevalent in those days so he wanted to abolish those evil those uh, those bad evils talaq was one of them so polygamy was polygamy was prevalent at that time muslims they uh, could marry means they were allowed to marry with more females they were having so polygamy was uh, common practice at that time and muslim men they used to exercise they had uncontrolled unrestricted right about divorce they just uh, pronounced that evil word talaq and by using that evil word they uh, used to give divorce to their wives so prophet muhammad was the first person who made slight modification in that practice in talaq and he though talaq was pre islamic that you you need to understand that two important pre islamic customs which were prevailing before the advent of islam that is talaq and mehar talaq and mehar these two customs are prevailing even before advent of islam so after after the advent of islam prophet muhammad duly approved these two customs pre islamic customs and these two after getting approval from prophet muhammad these two pre islamic customs became part of islamic law that is mehar dawar and talaq so prophet muhammad he made slight modification in these two customs pre islamic customs i will discuss in detail how he made slight modification in these two customs as i said quran is a primary source of muslim law now come to second primary source of muslim law that is sunnat so i have just uh, referred this sunnat as a source of source of law sunnat that is arabic word which literally means traditions of prophet muhammad so somewhere you will find sunnat and hadi both are different sunnat and hadi that is also referred as that is also accepted as second important source of muslim law so muslims they believe that whatever prophet muhammad said whatever he did for the betterment of mankind and whatever he uh, even he, when he was prophet muhammad was silent on a particular point even his silence was treated as approval on that particular issue which was brought into the notice of prophet muhammad so that was known as takrir sunnat e takrir means when prophet muhammad was silent on a particular point he didn't speak on that matter which was brought by his followers at that time if he didn't speak followers they drew inference that prophet muhammad was prophet muhammad was willing to accept that matter and that matter was accepted that matter was duly approved by prophet muhammad this kind of inference or inference was drawn by 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 his followers so i would like to discuss you see sunnat as i said sunnat is a second primary source of muslim law so sunnat ul qaul 
there are three important sunnat which I would like to discuss sunnatul kaul words spoken sunnatul fail conduct of prophet Muhammad became law for the Muslims what he said as I said what he said and even his silence became sunna became tradition of prophet Muhammad as I said if he was silent on a particular issue he did not speak on a particular matter which was brought into 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 his notice by his followers even his silence was treated as law for the Muslims. So, I think this is the second important source sunnat and third important source of Muslim law is ijma. Ijma as a source of Muslim law, ijma here is an Arabic word which literally means consensus of opinion. So, you see Prophet Muhammad once he said that every Muslim should follow the message of God, every Muslim should follow his preachings and sayings what he was uh, preaching to his followers and if things could not be resolved in the light of revelation of God or things which could not be decided in the light of traditions of Prophet Muhammad, he said that that thing must be decided with consensus. So, in this way the followers of Prophet Muhammad they started evolving new kind of rules for Islamic commonwealth, they started evolving new rules to decide dispute. So, Isma in this way Isma got recognition in Islamic world and Isma became third important source of Muslim law. So, I was talking about Isma as a third important source of Muslim law and I also highlighted that how Isma consensus opinion became third important source of Muslim law. So, you see every Muslim was not allowed to participate in formulating Isma, only those Muslims had privilege to evolve Isma who were the follower of Prophet Muhammad who were very who were those Muslims who were very close to Prophet Muhammad or you can say the companion of Prophet Muhammad were allowed to decide the cases, were allowed to formulate new kinds of rules and regulation. So, companion of Prophet Muhammad were allowed to formulate Isma. Second, Isma of successor of successors. I have just, uh, I am just sharing that content on your screen. You you look at this. So, Isma how Isma of successors, here successor means companion of Prophet Muhammad. So, companion of Prophet Muhammad were allowed to evolve Isma. Next successor of companion of Prophet Muhammad, after the death of companion of Prophet Muhammad, successor of companion of Prophet Muhammad they were allowed to evolve Isma, they, they decided to evolve new rules with consensus opinion and third types of Isma is Isma of jurist Isma evolved by Mujahid by law knowing person. So, in this way you, uh, we can see that there were three kinds of people who had privilege to formulate Isma who were allowed to evolve new kind of Isma, Isma of companions, Isma of followers, successor of companions and Isma of jurist. Now, come to the next, Qiyas is the fourth important source of Muslim law. Again I am sharing this on your screen, you look at this, Qiyas as a source of Muslim law. Qiyas is an Arabic word which literally means analogical deduction, Qiyas. It means the thing should be decided in the light of previous judgment or the thing should be compared 
with the standard one in deciding dispute though siasic does not recognize kias as a source of law you see siasic i will discuss how siasic and sunni sect came into existence when a split took place in islam when islam divided into two sect sunni sect and shia sect so after the death of prophet muhammad islam divided into two sect sunni sect and shia sect so sunni sect was being headed by abu bakr abu bakr became first caliph of sunni sect and ali husband of fatima became first imam of shia sect ali with the help of his followers formed a separate sect in islam and they were called shia shia literally means uh, a small group within faction with, within larger group and sunni literally means the followers of sunnat of prophet muhammad so it was decided by abu bakr that uh, being successor of prophet muhammad prophet abu bakr decided to for decided to establish new sect in islam because there was dispute regarding successor of islam who would succeed islam after death of prophet muhammad so uh, is it took place after the death of prophet muhammad that will be discussed in my next lecture i i would like to discuss it, it in detail when schools of muslim law would be discussed here you need to understand that in brief i would like to highlight some important things about sunni sect and shia sect how sunni sect and shia sect came into existence so here you see shia sect does not recognize kias as a source of law they believe that shia muslims they believe that kias was not a method was not good thing and uh, it was defective it had demerits so they they did not recognize kias as a source of muslim law so you all need to understand that these are four primary sources of muslim law quran sunnat ijma and kias i have also highlighted the logic the reason why these four sources are treated as considered as primary sources because of that belief that no authority has power to make law for muslims so quran is divine origin and sunnat that is also important that is very that plays very important role in the development of islamic law so we can say that quran and sunnat these two important texts these two important Uh, sources plays important source of muslim law and whenever we talk about source of law it means we are talking about origin of law so from where law originates if i talk about uh, source of law it means i am talking about origin of law from where law originates so you all need to understand that if we if i use this word source of law it means i am talking about origin of law so you all might be knowing about sources of law legislation is considered as source primary source of modern or modern source of law because it is the legislature which has to make the law judiciary can also play important role in deciding disputes so in our legal system if i talk about indian context so article 141 of the indian constitution which talks about judicial precedent so judicial precedent article 141 law declared by the supreme court shall be binding on all court within territory of india so that is judicial precedent and judiciary can also play important role in development of law and we can also say that indian supreme court has also played important role in social in 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 the development of law or in social transformation so here uh, i would like to discuss secondary source of muslim law so i think you all must have understood the things which i have just 
discussed in primary sources of Muslim law. Now come to secondary sources of Muslim law. So with the help of this slide, you all would be in position to understand that there are three important sources of Muslim law, custom, precedent and legislation. How custom has played important role in development of Islamic law? Then we will analyze, we will try to understand that how judicial precedent has played important role in development of Muslim law and third is legislation, how legislation has played important role in development of Islamic law. I will discuss one by one. Firstly, I would like to discuss custom, how custom is treated as secondary source of Muslim law and to what extent ancient customs, pre-Islamic customs have been accepted by Islamic law, have got due recognition in Muslim law. So, first of all, I would like to discuss Dover Meher. Dover was, as I have just highlighted about Dover and Talag. Dover was prevalent even before advent of Islam. So, the nature of Dover was different. So, I would like to discuss Dover in detail when Dover, when that chapter will be discussed. But here you need to understand that in Muslim law, Muslim husbands, they are supposed to pay something to their wives at the time of marriage. For what? As a token of respect, to just to respect the dignity of Muslim female, Muslim husbands, they are supposed to pay something to their wives at the time of marriage. But the form of dower was different before the advent of Islam. After advent of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, he made slight modification in dower and he duly, he duly approved dower and that is why dower is considered as meher e sunnat because meher, dower is Arabic word is meher, it is also referred as meher. So, it, it became sunnah, it became that dower was, meher was duly approved by Prophet Muhammad that is why it is referred as meher e sunnat. Talaq e sunnat, talaq was also duly approved by Prophet Muhammad that is why talaq, it is referred as talaq e sunnat. So, these two pre-Islamic customs have also been recognized in Islamic law, in Muslim law. Now, come to second precedent as a source of Muslim law. So, in this head, we will see that how judiciary has played important role in development of Islamic law, in development of Muslim law. The first case which was decided by Privy Council in 1960, you, I, I am sharing this content on your screen so that you can get complete information about secondary source of Muslim law. The name of case is Hamira Bibi versus Zubaida Bibi, 1916 Privy Council. The case was decided by Privy Council. A ratio of this case is the observation made by Privy Council in this case was simple interest on unpaid dower would be valid. So, this observation was made by Supreme uh, by Privy Council in Hamira Bibi versus Zubaida Bibi, 1960 Privy Council. Simple interest on unpaid dower would be realized by Muslim female. So, you see what and since then, it has been practiced among Muslims that in case of unpaid dower, Muslim female females are entitled to get unpaid dower from their husband. So, unpaid dower is treated as unsecured debt and unpaid in, in case of unpaid dower, Muslim wife is considered as creditor and husband is treated as debtor of his wife. So, be Muslim female being creditor has right to get back his money from her husband by filing a civil suit against him, though 
interest taking interest is haram that is prohibited act in islam islam doesn't permit to any muslim to take interest on money so that is prohibited act and prohibited act is referred as haram in muslim law so no muslim is allowed to take interest on loan that is prohibited act but privy council in 1916 said if dower if dower is not paid by muslim husband at at the time of marriage it would be treated as unpaid dower and muslim female would be entitled to get unpaid dower as well as simple interest accrued on unpaid dower that is first important thing which you need to understand second case president judicial president that has played important role in development of islamic law and you you will be surprised to know that that judicial pronouncement has changed entire matrix of islamic law the name of that case is muhammad ahmad versus sabano air 1985 supreme court muhammad ahmad versus sabano air 1985 supreme court in that case supreme court for the first time held that even divorced muslim women is entitled to get maintenance from her husband for her remaining life period though the judgment was in contravention with provision of islamic law under muslim law it is specifically provided that muslim husband is obliged to maintain his wife up to the period of iddat that is generally 3 months after the expiry of iddat period muslim husband is not obliged to provide financial assistance to his wife so this is law and this is specifically provided in muslim law but what supreme court said in sabano case supreme court held that a divorced muslim woman is entitled to get maintenance from her husband for her life period until she remains unmarried so she can also get permanent alimony from her husband the condition is that she should remain unmarried and you see hue and cry was made by muslims that it was a judicial intervention in their personal matters and as a result of that parliament had to pass a special legislation the name of that legislation is the muslim women in bracket protection of right on divorce act 1986 in brief that act is also referred as the muslim women act 1986 well dear students i was talking about shabano case mohammad ahmed versus shabano ir 1985 supreme court i do believe that you all have understood the things which i have just discussed about shabano case the second important case which played important role in development of islamic law in and which has changed the entire mat law regarding talaq you see recently supreme court in sharabano i am just sharing is content of that slide on your screen you can just see secondary sources of muslim law so you see in this head i have also referred case 3 you just look at this shara bano versus union of india air 2017 supreme court you see you all might be aware about this case shara bano case shara bano she fought a battle against those muslims who used to use talaq that evil word as a effective means weapon against their wives just to get rid of from matrimonial tie and just by pronouncing evil word muslim male they used to give divorce talaq to their wives so considering the gravity of those that matter and plight of indian muslim women supreme court in sara bano case versus union of india air 2017 held that triple talaq pronouncement of talaq thrice would be punishable would be an offense and muslim male 
would be punishable for pronouncing that evil word. So, you see how Supreme Court took it serious and Supreme Court, uh, Honorable Supreme Court held that, that even Muslim female has right to live with all human dignity and right to life that is guaranteed under article 21 of the Indian constitution, article 14, 15 that is also article 14 and 15 as you all might be knowing about, article 14 talks about right to equality, article 15 talks about state uh, prohibits state from making any kind of discrimination on the, on the ground of race, caste, sex. So, you see how Supreme Court made harmonious interpretation of article 14, 15 and 21 just to give uh, liberty to Muslim female to live with all human dignity to live to maintain just to uh, just to pay due respect to the Muslims honorable Supreme Court declared triple talaq unconstitutional. Unconstitutional because it violates article 14 of the Indian constitution, it is against the equality Muslim male, Muslim men they have got more liberty, more privilege in comparison to Muslim female and that is that is discriminatory that is violation of article 14. Supreme Court further observed that it would be it would be also violation of article 21 of the Indian constitution because Muslim female is entitled Muslim married women are also entitled to live with all human dignity with all. So, in the light of article 21 Supreme Court said that pronouncement of the law it degrades the dignity of Muslim female. So, it would be violative of article 21 of the Indian constitution. So, in this way you see how judiciary honorable Supreme Court uh, if you talk about uh, Indian context we can see that how Indian Supreme Court has played important role in development of Islamic law. So, with the help of these two pronouncements Sabano case and Sarabano case, we can understand the spirit of judicial pronouncement. Now, I would like to discuss third important source of secondary source of Muslim law that is legislation. Again, I am emphasizing this legislation is treated as secondary source in Islam, whereas legislation is considered as modern source of law. In modern era, it is the legislature which has to make law for the society. So, legislation is treated as modern source of law, but under Muslim law, legislation is treated as secondary source of Muslim law. The reason behind accepting the reason behind recognizing legislation as a secondary source of Muslim law is that legislation legislature cannot make law for the Muslims or authority no authority state is not allowed to make any kind of amendment in Quran or Sunnah. Because of that belief legislation is referred as secondary source of Muslim law. So, I, I would like to highlight some important legislations which parliament has enacted for the betterment of Muslim female, for the betterment of Muslims. So, with the help of those legislations, we would like to understand that how legislature has played important role in making law for Muslims. So, the first important legislation which you can uh, look on your screen. So, you look at this Muslim personal law in bracket Shariat application act 1937. In brief that act is also referred as referred as the Shariat act 1937. Section 2 is very important. According to section 2, there are 10 subject matters which or exclusively applicable to the Muslims. You see this is the Shariat Act which was enacted by the British government in 1937. 
just to identify, just to recognize those 10 subject matters on which Muslim personal law would be applicable. What are those 10 matters? I would like to highlight those 10 matters. Section 2, according to section 2, marriage, maintenance, dower, divorce, trust, work, guardianship, gift, hiba, these are 10 subject matters enumerated in section 2 of the Sharia Act 1937. To all these 10 subject matters, only Muslim personal law would be applicable. So, you see ma uh, rules regarding marriage, rules regarding maintenance, dower, mehar, gift. You, you will be surprised to know that Transfer of Property Act 1882 is not applicable to Muslims. We all know that Transfer of Property Act 1882 was enacted in the year of 1882. And you all, be, you all would be surprised to know, dear students, Transfer of Property Act talks about gift, sale. Sale is provided in the section 54 of the Transfer of Property Act. So, if uh, seller is Muslim, if Muslim male, if Muslim person is willing to sell his property, then section 54 of Transfer of Property Act would be applicable. Sale deed would be valid only after the fulfillment of conditions provided in section 54 of the Transfer of Property Act. Irrespective of caste, creed and religion, things must be fulfilled by the parties. Contrary to this, if Muslim, if Muslim person wants to make a gift, hiba, that is referred as hiba. So, section 122 of the Transfer of Property Act, which talks about gift, would not be applicable. So, you need to understand this. Now, I would like to highlight another important legislation that is important legislation and has played important role in development of Islamic law that is the dissolution of Muslim Marriage Act 1939. The dissolution of Muslim Marriage Act 1939 talks about grounds on which Muslim female can take divorce from her husband. So, you see it was a big achievement for Muslim female and Britishers after considering the plight of Muslim female enacted special legislation for the betterment of Muslim female in 1939. The name of that legislation is the Dissolution of Muslim Marriage Act 1950, 1939. The beauty of this act is only Muslim females are entitled to get the benefit of this act. Muslim male cannot take the benefit of this act you need to understand this. First thing, there are 8 grounds enumerated in this act, there are 8 grounds mentioned in this act on which Muslim females are entitled to get divorce from their husband. Before the commencement of this act, Muslim female were not in position to get divorce from their husband. So, this is first, uh, this is another important legislation which you can, now next important legislation is the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Divorce Act 1986, which I have already highlighted in Sabano case, how this act was enacted by parliament just to negate the judgment of Supreme Court delivered in Sabano case. Another important legislation, Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Divorce, Rights on Marriage Act 2009. I am sharing this slide so that you can have complete understanding about legislation as a source of Muslim law. So, with the help of this slide, you all would be in position to understand that how legislature in India has played important role in development of Muslim. You see Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Marriage Act, 19, um, Marriage Act 2019. This legislation was enacted by Indian parliament after judicial pronouncement when Supreme Court declared triple talaq unconstitutional in Sarah Banu case. The beauty of this act is pronouncement of tri triple talaq would be an offense. The nature of the, you see, in order to make this legislation more effective, the nature of offense is 
cognizable and non bailable you see the, the beauty of this act is whenever muslim husband who has given divorce to his wife by pronouncing talaq would be punished the maximum punishment is 3 years or fine or both i am quickly i am quickly highlighting this the salient feature of this act so that you can get entire information due to shortage of time i am concluding my lecture but before before concluding my lecture i would like to highlight some important features you see as i said in order to make this act more effective triple talaq has been made an offense has been made punishable pronouncement of triple talaq would be an offense under this act muslim husband if he makes any kind of pronouncement of talaq if he utters that evil word talaq he would be punished maximum punishment nature of offense is cognizable non bailable and the important feature of this act is that whenever muslim husband is giving liberty to get bail from the court before granting bail to the muslim husband culprit muslim husband opportunity must be given to the muslim female muslim wife to whom muslim to whom her husband has given divorce before providing opportunity of hearing to that muslim female bail cannot be granted to the muslim so you see this in this way in this way the principle of natural justice has also been incorporated in this act that before grant of bail to the muslim husband to the culprit muslim female must be heard so that she can raise objection about grant of bail of her husband so i think after making thorough analysis of all these things i do believe that you all must have understood the things which i have discussed in my this first lecture and in this way i would like to conclude this lecture thank you all very much